we concluded last week after discussing only the first couple of verses of Deuteronomy chapter 23, I believe it was. And, um, yeah. And there is so much here in this chapter, we're still not going to finish this today. Now, some months ago, <clears throat> years, I suppose now, Rabbi Baruch published a superb article and it was put onto TorahClass.com website. It was entitled, Jewish Identity and the Torah. Excellent article in which he deals with just how modern day believers, Jewish and Gentile, are to consider the application of the Torah law to our lives. And he does a superb job with it. He uses different terms than I typically use to explain, but the end result is essentially the same. Whereas I say God principles that undergird the laws, he'll speak of the spirit of the law as opposed to the letter, a term that I think is indeed a better choice and I intend to adopt it. Uh, therefore, as we go through Moses' Sermon on the Mount here in Moab, keep in mind that just as he was reviewing and in some cases explaining the principles, the spirit, behind these many commandments, because Israelite culture was about to transition from life as Bedouin wanderers to that of a settled people. So it is that we must adapt the principles behind these commandments to a much more advanced era in which we live. But always it is the spirit of the law that matters. Therefore, it is only the Holy Spirit living within us who can guide us to carry them out in a way that is in harmony with the Lord's will. But as Yeshua said in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 17 through 20, adapting these laws to the evolving state of societies in order to retain the spirit of the law never implies that the law is dead and gone or abolished or even changed. Well, verse 2 of Deuteronomy 23 began a list of of who should be excluded from the kahal, the assembly of Israel. And we found that we should probably not take that word assembly to mean every element of Israeli society that together loosely forms the nation of Israel. Rather, it's more appropriate to see this meaning of assembly as full-fledged and wholehearted citizens of Israel. Now, as you can imagine, over the centuries, there was a great and ongoing debate about just who could be included as part of the assembly, and who couldn't? Who could have any and every right afforded to an Israelite? Who could only enjoy some or none of those rights? Now, we shouldn't be surprised at this concept of an unequal range of rights for residents of Israel. As Americans, our laws create a number of distinctions in society about what status we hold as residents within our society. If you are second or third generation American, you are a full citizen with all rights accorded. If you are a new immigrant and you have obtained a green card as a means of legal residence, um, but are not a citizen, then you have many rights and duties of a citizen, but not all. You may participate in elections of public officials for our nations. Uh, in some instance, other instances you can't. But if you are here without documentation, then even though you may in many ways benefit from or contribute to the economics of our society, you can't vote. You usually can't be in the military, as far as I know. All right, get Social Security. Theoretically, you're not supposed to even have a job. Therefore, there's even a status in between holding a green card and being here illegally, whereby you have some rights and not others. Ancient, in other words, ancient Israel was very similar in its societal structure as what we see in our structure in this way. The Torah explains it. So from the time Israel conquered Canaan through the era of the judges, then the brief period under David and Solomon when Israel was a single unified nation, to the period of the divided kingdom and the kings, then to the exiles, 
to Assyria, later on to Babylon, then finally to the New Testament era, the criteria for being admitted to Israel as the kingdom of God and, the bear, and bearing the status of a full citizen, it changed and it evolved. Well, at the earliest time, there was actually no formal procedure for a foreigner to join Israel. There was no committee, there wasn't any paperwork, there was no ritual for inclusion or conversion. So how did a foreigner become an Israelite? Primarily by assimilation. A man and his family might move to one of the Israelite tribal territories, slowly adopt Israelite culture, and in time gain acceptability. Perhaps they would join in some visceral way the biblical feast. They'd keep Shabbat. They'd stay openly, stop openly worshiping whatever gods they brought with them. Their children might begin life knowing nothing uh, but a Hebrew way of life, playing with the Hebrew children and then just blending in. Maybe a Hebrew man would marry one of these children and soon they'd have children who are now seen as more Israelite than anything else. Another generation passes and no remnant of their foreign identity remains, nor would the new generation have any conscious identity with their foreign ancestors. They were now Israelites. As a matter of routine, the third and fourth generation former immigrants had their boy babies circumcised because that's what everybody did. And by outward appearances, there was really no discernible difference between them and the descendants of Jacob. Later, though, sages and eventually rabbis began to see the admission of foreigners into Israel as more of a legal matter, so it needed supervision. Therefore, they came up with some guidelines. For instance, a Hebrew man was permitted to marry a foreign girl who lived in one of Israel's tribal territories, and such a thing instantly made that girl an Israelite. But in general, a Hebrew girl was discouraged from marrying a foreign man who lived in Israel because now this made her less of a Hebrew and put her on a possible path of giving up her Israelite identity. The product of their marriage, their offspring, became even more problematic. What were these children in the sight of Israelite society? Hebrews or foreigners? Half of each. So this dilemma and how each generation of Israelites dealt with these problems of nationality, citizenship, ethnic identity, all this, explains the fuzziness of the term we encounter in the third verse of Deuteronomy 23, where it typically says in English that a misbegotten, or in some Bibles it uses the word bastard, may not become part of the assembly of Israel. That word is being, the word that's being translated in Hebrew is mamzer, mamzer. Well, let's reread a portion of Deuteronomy chapter 23 and begin at verse 3. Deuteronomy 23, we're going to read verses 3 through 19. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it's page 222. A mamzer may not enter the assembly of Adonai, nor may his descendants down to the tenth generation enter the assembly of Adonai. No uh, Ammoni or uh, Moabi, no Ammonite, no Moabite may enter the assembly of Adonai, nor may any of his descendants down to the tenth generation ever enter the assembly of Adonai, because they did not supply you with food and water when you were on the road after leaving Egypt. And because they hired Bilam, the son of Beor from Petor in Aram Naharim, to put a curse on you. But Adonai your God would not listen to Bilam. Rather, Adonai your God turned the curse into a blessing for you because Adonai your God loved you. You are never to seek their peace or well being as long as you leave, but you are not to detest an Edomite because he's your brother. You're not to detest an Egyptian because you lived as a foreigner in his land. The third generation of children born to them may enter the assembly of Adonai. When you are in camp at war with your enemies, you are to guard yourself against anything bad. If there's a man among you who's unclean because of nocturnal emission, he's to go outside the camp. He's not to enter the camp. When evening arrives, he's to bathe himself in water, and after sunset, he can enter the camp. 
You are to have an area outside the camp to use as a latrine. You must include a trowel with your equipment. And when you relieve yourself, you are to dig a hole first and afterwards cover your excrement. For Adonai, your God, moves about in your camp to rescue you and to hand over your enemies to you. Therefore, your camp must be a holy place. Adonai should not see anything indecent among you or he'll turn away from you. If a slave has escaped from his master and taken refuge with you, you're not to hand him back to his master. Allow him to stay with you in whichever place suits him best among your settlements. Don't mistreat him. No woman of Israel is to engage in ritual prostitution. No man of Israel is to engage in ritual homosexual prostitution. Nothing earned through heterosexual or homosexual prostitution is to be brought into the house of Adonai, your God, in fulfillment of any vow, for both of these are aberrant to Adonai, your God. Here's the thing. Scholars have a real problem dating the precise regulations listed in Deuteronomy 23 for who can be excluded from Israel and who must be accepted. And among these regulations is the issue of exactly who and what is a mamzer. The generally accepted opinion among Jewish and Christian scholars is that while that while what we read in Deuteronomy may have originally come from roughly the time of Moses, but more than likely from the time of his predecessor, Joshua, the examples given, along with the precise nationalities of exactly who can join Israel and who can't, might have come a little later and probably evolved over time. But understand, whether these scholars are right or wrong about the date, the underlying principle of this commandment can be rather easily extracted. I want to remind you of something that we sometimes prefer to ignore. Believers, especially evangelical Christians, say with conviction that the Bible is infallible and it's literal and we should take it exactly as it is and that's because it's trustworthy. I completely agree with all that. However, what that actually means, how it's manifested, is some what of a more complex matter. In this room today, I suspect we have several different Bible versions that are being used. When you hold them up in parallel, and at times I'm going to compare, I'll compare as many as eight or ten or more versions simultaneously, even in various languages for study purposes, there can be some rather significant variations. So, which of these is the infallible version. Do you have it? How about you? Is yours the infallible one, but theirs isn't? See, let me remind you of something that um, is difficult. When comparing the original King James Version to, say, the more modern Life Application Bible, or to the NIV, on the surface, the differences can be almost alarming. But in reality, the issue is more in the way that the English language has mutated rather than in translator, translators attempting to assert entirely different meaning to the same passage, although in some cases that is their intent. In other cases, it's that the names or the nations or the cities have changed over the centuries. So the older name becomes a relic, gets abandoned. So the latest name for the city or the nation is inserted in place of the older name, uh, name that's no longer in use. Does that mean the Bible's been fundamentally changed? No. For the average person, they're going to get a lot more meaning out of it by calling Bethel, for instance, Bethel, instead of its most ancient name, Luz. So it's natural that as time went on and the Bible was recopied, sometimes the place names would change to the current ones used that day. And the names of nations regarded as examples of evil nations might change because the nation, as mentioned, might even be extinct. So with that concept in mind, what is this mamzer who is excluded from Israel? 
Well, I can tell you for certain that it's not at all about being a child born to unwed parents. Rather, a mamzer is the product of an unlawful union, unlawful according to the Torah. A mamzer is the result of some kind of illicit mixture. And as my detour hopefully explained, precisely what combination of, of people and circumstances defined a prohibited mixture, that evolved over time. In later rulings by Hebrew religious authorities, there were three presumptions that were made about the first nine verses of Deuteronomy that helped them in determining how to carry out this law in its proper spiritual intent. And it was using these three presumptions that they made and modified that their various rulings came along about mamzerim, the plural of mamzer, over the ages. The first presumption was that at the core of these verses is the idea that it is dealing with marriage. Secondly, that any foreigner may convert to Judaism without exception. And thirdly, that the assembly of Israel should be defined as full-fledged citizens of Israel who are citizens because they were native-born Israelites who were the product of legitimate marriages. And as a result of these three presumptions, the law concerning the definition of who was a mamzer and what their status in Israel could be went something like this. The men covered by this restriction may not marry a native-born Hebrew girl. However, they are permitted to marry a girl who was formerly a foreigner but is converted to Judaism. Further, a mamzer living in Israel may marry another mamzer. Oh, the rabbis are good at this stuff. So a Jewish man could marry a foreign girl, provided she was a convert, but a Jewish girl could not marry a, fo a male who became Jewish by means of conversion. If any of these regulations were violated, the resulting children were mamzerim, but they certainly weren't bastards, as we call them. They just weren't the products of unions of people that the Hebrew religious authorities deemed as Torah authorized. Therefore, as the children of religiously unauthorized unions, the children were deemed to be mamzerim. Now, let me say that in another way. It's not that the Hebrews decided that a marriage of, say, a Jewish girl to a foreign man was illegal, and therefore, when they had children, it would be as though the girl was pregnant out of wedlock, but anything like that. Rather, it's that this is a flawed union that shouldn't have occurred under the ideal that the Lord has established, and therefore the children of that union can't be assigned as full citizens of Israel. The children aren't shunned. They just don't have all the rights of the other children who are the products of authorized marriages. So this law of Mamzer, of the Mamzer in verse 3, you see, connects with the law of verse 4, where whereby no foreigner from Moab or Ammon can become a full citizen of Israel, nor can any descendant of a Moabite or Ammonite become a full citizen of Israel for ten generations. Now, why is this? Because it is said that during the Exodus, the Moabites and the Ammonites would not assist Israel with food and water. But not only that, they hired a sorcerer. Bilam to come and put a curse on Israel, which as it turned out, he didn't do. In fact, the Moabites and the Ammonites are to be seen as people that Israel should have nothing to do with. Israel shouldn't necessarily go after them to harm them, but neither should they seek them as friends and allies, certainly not as potential family members. I want to say bluntly that these verses have created all kinds of problems. First is that most scholars take the admonition that no, abider, Ammonite, no Moabite or Ammonite can become a citizen of Israel for ten generations to be a poetic way of saying forever. 
However, apparently the ancient Hebrews didn't see it that way because in time, Moab and Ammon became friendly to Israel and intermarriage was common. Second, if the 10 means precisely 10, not forever, when does the count of the 10 generations begin? When does it end? Does it count when Israel conquered Canaan? Does it count from when an Ammonite or a Moabite first moves to Israel as a resident alien? Another issue is about Ammon and Moab not meeting the Israelites with the food and water. Does this mean that they refused to sell these essentials to Israel, or they simply didn't offer them as a gift? See, it's better to look at the underlying principles than to get involved with all the precise names and numbers in this particular matter, because we may never know exactly what this is meant to the what this meant to the mind of the original writer. The first thing to understand, though, is that. As the second of the three presumptions of the verses I told you about, it is not that Ammonites and Moabites are to be excluded from living in Israel. There is no racial objection, or they're not to be treated differently from any other re resident alien living among the Hebrews in the Promised Land. It's only that their status is limited, at least for several generations. As a general principle of the Torah, it is that resident aliens are to be treated with respect and they're to be given full protection under the law. This went for Moabites and Ammonites as well. But perhaps at the bedrock level, the reason why some foreigners are accepted into Israel, others are rejected, is this. People who are involved in illicit unions, or are the products of illicit unions, or that are not physically whole, eunuchs, for example, are rejected as candidates for joining Israel. Perfection, or better, wholeness, in God's eyes, is the requirement for holiness in both the Old Testament and the New. And holiness is bestowed by God upon all members of Israel. Priests were especially required to be whole. They couldn't have physical defects. A priest who, say, lost part of a finger in an accident, or who had a, a limb shrivel up due to a disease, could no longer officiate at the tabernacle. Messiah says in the last verse of Matthew 5 at his Sermon on the Mount, therefore be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. The Lord God used these examples that we are reading about in the Torah as illustrations of the need for perfection, for perfect wholeness, in order to be admitted to the kingdom of God. The point that the Father was always making was that it was trust in Him, acceptance of His grace, that's what clothed us in that perfection. It was that that made us acceptable in his eyes. Even for the Israelites, it was not righteous behavior that won you acceptance into the kingdom of God. It was grace. But after you were graced into the kingdom, it was observing God's laws and commandments in their proper spirit that kept you in the kingdom and maintained your harmony with God. Upon the advent of Yeshua, it is that He is to be our unstained garment of righteousness that we put on as a sign of our acceptance into the kingdom. Acceptance or rejection into the kingdom has at all times, in every era, Old Testament, New Testament, it's been a spiritual issue, always, despite terribly misconceived and false doctrines to the contrary. Now, the reason for the Ammonites and Moabites having this special restriction against them seems to be historic in nature. When Israel needed help, they wouldn't give them any. Think about that for a little bit. When Israel needed help, 
Those nations refused to give them any, and God cursed them for it. Oh, my. Israel, or rather Ammon and, 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 and Moab, refused to let Israel pass through. Moab even tried to have Israel cursed. Further, they apparently sold Israel the essentials of life that they needed without offering it to them as the guests that they were. See, this was a great offense. Understand that in the Bible era, when a guest came to you, usually the guest was a stranger, it was the custom to offer them food and drink as a friend. Now certainly, the guest would have offered to pay for it as a courteous response, and we actually see this offer by Moses in the Torah to pay for food and water. But then this little kabuki dance occurs in which these, these, these uh, courtesies fly back and forth until the guest either appropriately accept, accepts the hospitality of the host or if there's too many guests. And it would be unfair to expect these strangers to give them the supplies for free, then the host reluctantly accepts some money for them. That's how it worked. Still works that way to this day, as a matter of fact. Now, Ammon and Moab insulted the Lord's people, and therefore the Lord. So, the wonderful blessing of joining with Israel was held back from Moab and Ammon. See, don't ever think this idea or this example of what God expects of Gentile nations towards Israel eventually left Jewish thought or God's thought. Listen to Jesus' statement about this in Matthew 25, verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you whom my father has blessed, take your inheritance. The kingdom is prepared for you from the founding of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you made me your guest. You see, so many of the passages of the New Testament and the sayings of Yeshua actually recall the ancient historical happenings of Israel's past. They, of course, remained embedded in the Hebrew cultural fabric. Just as this statement of Messiah in the book of Matthew so eloquently says, those who the Father has blessed are welcome to come and take their inheritance as part of Israel. What are the criteria for being blessed? I was hungry, you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you welcomed me. It's exactly the opposite of what Ammon and Moab did. This is why Torah class and Seed of Abraham Ministries actively and constantly gives to and cares for God's people in Israel. We don't do it because we're wonderful people. We do it because it's our duty. We do it because it's our joy as believers to do it. Ammon and Moab did none of this for God's people, so they were excluded from joining God's people and from participating in the inheritance reserved for God's people, Israel. Certainly, Yeshua used this as an illustration of welcoming Him. But the point is that as Gentiles, we will have much about our actions judged, especially on a national level, by how we treat Israel. I've said on numerous occasions that we can boil down the way the, judge, the Lord will judge every man, every woman, based on two things. Our individual decision on Christ is our salvation, and on our national decision concerning our treatment of Israel. As we've studied Torah for a long time now, carefully examining the Word of God in context, what now would you suppose is the Lord's stance on that portion of the church who sides with the Arab and Muslim world against his people Israel? What do you think is God's position on believers? Believers. 
who could care less about Israel or about the Jewish people or their fate. How might we expect to be received when we stand before him in heaven if we treat Israel essentially the same way the Moabites and the Ammonites did? Let's get back to our subject of the Mamzer by pointing out something interesting. Ruth, an ancestor of Jesus, was a Moabite. She married a Hebrew man, Boaz. Were their children Mamzerim? No, because she converted to the religion of the Hebrews. Your God shall be my God. She said to Naomi, and because it was permitted for a Hebrew man to marry a foreign woman who converted to the Hebrew belief. Ruth's marriage to Boaz is proof that the ten generations of prohibition meant exactly that, and further, that no nation was given blanket exclusion forever from Israel. The key to being allowed to join Israel is exactly as Ruth pronounced to her Hebrew mother-in-law, your God shall be my God and your people shall be my people. That's the key to it. Now, an inter as interesting as the exclusions of Ammon and Moab from Israel is the inclusion of Edom and Egypt. There is Indeed is mentioned a rather short-term temporary exclusion of three generations of Egyptians and Edomites. But afterwards, all restrictions are removed. And although I'm sure many Israelites of Moses' era would argue with God's rationale for this somewhat unexpected acceptance of Edom and Egypt as candidates for joining Israel, his reasons are stated for us. As for Edom, he says, it's because he's your brother. How is Edom a brother of, e of Israel? Edom is another name for Esau. Edom means red, which is a kind of nickname for Esau, son of Isaac, who we are told was born with reddish hair and had a ruddy complexion, generally much like King David would have had. Esau's twin brother was Jacob whose name was later changed to Israel. So indeed, Edom and Israel are brothers. In fact, they were fraternal twins, and the Lord intended on honoring this relationship. Now further, even though what we generally remember about Esau and Jacob is how Jacob deceived Esau by taking his birthright, and then how Esau intended to kill Jacob for this fraud, they reconciled. When Jacob returned to Canaan from Mesopotamia with his two wives and a number of children and servants in tow, the Lord had promised Isaac, their father, that he would bless Esau. Apparently, this was sufficient for the nation of Edom to be forgiven for doing essentially the same thing to Israel that Ammon and Moab did. Because Edom refused to let Israel pass through their land, forced them to march all the way around Edom on their way to the Promised Land. Now, as for Egypt, hmm. as unlikely as it would seem on the surface, the Lord has reserved a special place in his heart for Egypt. In the end times, Egypt will be viewed as somewhat better than the nations who surround Israel, and they're going to be given certain rewards. This is because it is in Egypt where Israel sojourned. And apparently the Lord is sort of balancing the great honor and respect that Egypt accorded Israel when they first arrived. I mean, remember when Joseph was the vizier of Egypt? And that was for about half of their stay there. Versus the very hard oppression Egypt eventually forced upon Israel during the last half of their stay in Egypt. And all this seems to have led God, of course, rescuing them via Moses. So without doubt, this decision about Egypt 
was as practical as well as an ideal matter because thousands of Egyptians had attached themselves to Israel as they fled Egypt. So impressed were they with the God of Israel. What was to be their status, though, within Israel? After a couple of generations, perhaps the first two generations of Egyptians were part of the wilderness journey, that third generation could be admitted to Israel. Very likely, the descendants of those Egyptians that accompanied Israel from Egypt and who produced children and then died out in the wilderness were almost instantly made full citizens upon the conquering of the Promised Land. Now, the next several verses, 10 to 15, switches topics. Now we're going to deal with holy war. A little more specifically, it deals with the military camp, which is essentially what Israel is at this point in history. Israel truly is God's army convened for a holy war. Jehovah is the divine warrior leader. Israel is his troops. And since this war is led by the Holy One, the camp itself has to be held in sanctity. Therefore, we get some rules about how you do that. And the general principle is stated at the end of verse 10. You're to guard, get, you're to guard yourself against anything bad, meaning evil. This is referring to being sure that all of God's rules and ordinances are followed. The first rule is that of so-called nocturnal emissions, an inadvertent flow of semen by a man. When this happens to a man, especially in God's war camp, he must leave the camp until he's ritually purified. This is not some kind of strange superstition. It is illustrative of a profound, profound God principle. I stated at the outset of the last, le uh, last couple of lessons that human sexuality is at the heart of of this section of Moses' sermon and underlies the foundation of the entire Bible. So just as a woman is declared impure by the onset of her monthly cycle, so is a man declared impure by an unintended emission from his reproductive system. In one case, a human egg is rejected is not viable. In the other case, Sperm is spontaneously emitted, but it has no opportunity to create new life. Impurity happens to both males and females, in this case, because of a misuse of God's procreative system, even if it's unavoidable. Therefore, it's not called sin. This is not sin. However, by definition, this failure of procreation, whereby not all eggs survive, not all sperm meant for fertilization is put to its intended use, it's the result of mankind's sinful nature and condition. Death of the ovum and sperm should never have been, for they contain life, precious life. Therefore, verse 11 declares that this man, in this case a soldier, who had this omission has to immediately leave the camp and go to a designated place outside of the camp. There he has what I call a wash and a wait. He must purify himself by bathing in water and then wait until the sun goes down. Then he can re-enter the camp. Recall, a Hebrew day begins at sundown. So essentially, he has to wait for the current day to end, the new day to begin, then he can return, be cleansed, and be restored. Sin only occurs if the soldier doesn't follow this procedure. This points out again that while sin and impurity are related, they're not the same thing. And therefore, we find that the biblical principle that while water is used for cleansing impurity, only blood can atone for sin. They're not interchangeable. <clears throat> now, please take notice of the principle of being sent away because of impurity, but being allowed back in once purified. Paul explains this principle of being separated 
but then being taken back by means of a different metaphor, the olive tree of Romans 11. Because he explains that although much of Israel became impure by not accepting their Messiah, Yeshua, should they change their minds, they can be made pure and taken back. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 11 in your Bibles. This is a section that many of you are becoming more and more familiar with because it completely refutes an all too common doctrine that God has rejected Israel and replaced them with the Gentile church. Chapters 9, 10, and 11 of Romans especially deals with this issue. So we're going to go to Romans 11. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it is page, um, let's see, we're going to start at 16, so it's going to be page 1415, 1415, if you have a complete Jewish Bible. And we're going to read from verses 16 through 24. Familiar passages. Now, if the challah offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole loaf. And if the root is holy, then so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, Gentiles, a wild olive were grafted in among them, and you've become equal sharers in the rich root of the olive tree, don't boast as if you're better than the branches. However, if you do boast, remember, you're not supporting the root. The root's supporting you. So you will say branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. True, but so what? They were broken off because of their lack of trust. However, you keep your place only because of your trust. So don't be arrogant. On the contrary, be terrified. For if God didn't spare the natural branches, he certainly won't spare you. So take a good look at God's kindness and his severity. On the one hand, severity towards those who fell off. But on the other hand, God's kindness towards you, provided you maintain yourself in that kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. Moreover, the others, if they don't lack, if they don't persist in their lack of trust, they'll be grafted in, because God is able to graft them back in. For if you were cut out of what by his nature a wild olive tree, and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these natural branches be grafted back in to their own olive tree? For brothers, I want you to understand this truth which God formerly concealed but now has revealed, so that you won't imagine that you know more than you actually do. It is that stoniness to a degree has come upon Israel until the Gentile world enters its fullness, and that it is in this way that all Israel will be saved. As the Tanakh says... Excuse me, my pages are stuck together here. Come on. Out of Zion will come the Redeemer. He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Okay. Just as the man with the nocturnal emission is removed from the camp of Israel because he's impure, but he can come back once he's cleansed, so it is for those branches, certain Hebrews, who were cut off of the tree of Israel because they refused to accept Messiah, were thus impure. But they can return once they are cleansed by being immersed into the purity of Yeshua and atoned for by accepting his blood. In Deuteronomy 23, verse 13 now, is a law that is, of course, both practical and it's a teaching tool. It is that people who need to relieve themselves are to go outside the camp to do it. They're to take some kind of a digging instrument, dig a hole, and then cover it up. To have exposed bodily waste inside the sanctity of the holy war camp where God walks is unthinkable. Now understand that the notion of God walking is used figuratively. It's, me it's, it's meant in the sense of God's presence. In ancient times, the owner of, a, of land walks his land as symbolic of possession. And it's this mental picture that's being expressed to us here. Chapter 23 then shifts gears again. In verse 16, when it lays down the law of the fugitive slave. Now, contrary to all known laws, 
of the Middle East in Bible times, the Lord says that if a fugitive slave, and by definition this would be a foreign slave who's run away from his foreign master, if that slave comes into any of Israel's tribal territories, he is to receive asylum. In a nutshell, this is a law that bans forcefully returning slaves to their masters. The idea is that a person who is being held against his will by a slave master, which typifies an evil force, but he manages to escape and come to the land set apart for God's people, should not be rejected, should not be forced to return. What a beautiful picture and pattern is set out for us in this. We, as foreigners to God and his people, escape our cruel slave master, Satan, and we run to our Jewish Savior for sanctuary in his kingdom. The rule is that not only must we be accepted, but that the king of this kingdom will never force us to return to our former slave master and into that former condition. Here in Deuteronomy 23, that spiritual principle is laid out in physical form so we can better understand it. Even more, these escaped slaves must be allowed to live freely among Israel, not to be told where they can reside, where they can't reside. They must not be ill-treated. They must not be shunned. In God's eyes, they're just as valuable as those people who are natural-born free Israelites. Now, this next law in verse 18 is going to take some explaining because a lot of new understanding of what this primary subject addresses. That which is usually translated as a cult prostitute. And the law is that whatever a prostitute of either sex earns for their services is never to be offered up to God as a vow payment or a sacrifice or as a tithe. And such a thing is aberrant to God because it's another example of illicit mixture. The money gained from this practice came from an unauthorized union. Therefore, the money, the fruit of the union, is tainted. It's unacceptable. We've talked about how sex was often used in religious practices and pagan religions at other times, but I want to take a couple of minutes to, uh, to help you understand a little better just what all this means. <clears throat> One of the reasons that the term temple prostitute or cult prostitute is chosen as the English translation in this verse is because the Hebrew word used is Kedeshah. Kedeshah. Literally, the word does not mean prostitute. Rather, believe it or not, it means holy woman. A priestess. Yet, in the Hebrew culture, see, this word took on a very derogative meaning, partly because in Israel's priesthood system, only men could be priests. And because this pagan female holy woman would have been by definition serving a false god or goddess. Nothing could be more indicative of an illicit union in every way. So Kedesha eventually became an idiom for prostitute, one who engages in illicit unions for money. Now while to this point Records of ancient times do not explicitly say that some of the female priests committed ritual sex for their gods. We have plenty of pictographs that obviously indicate that they did. And some ancient narratives that also heavily imply this gross religious ritual. The most common pictograph that we have is of a goddess mating with a god for the purpose of creating a new god, their son. And there is every reason to assume that female priests would have sex with male priests as a kind of commemorative drama to reenact that. What is equally as disgusting, maybe more, is that the evidence is that male priests would dress up as and take on the role of females. <clears throat> 
and performed the same ritual with another male priest, but he would dress up in the male role. Thus, we have the reference to the wages of a dog, which was just a common idiom that meant homosexual male prostitute. Now, we have significant written evidence about the common connection between brothels and the various temples to the gods. The records of the incomparable Greek historian Herodotus give us graphic and rather detailed accounts of how and why this system operated and that it was modeled after a long-standing custom of the pagans. Basically, there were two types of temple or cult prostitution systems. First, there indeed were houses of prostitution maintained by the temple authorities. Again, I want to emphasize I'm talking about pagan temples, not the Hebrew temple. And they were income-producing businesses. The temple to the goddess Aphrodite in Corinth was well known as having a major portion of its income produced by its string of brothels. The second was that in some places, young girls who were betrothed were required to serve as prostitutes because it was seen as honoring to the gods, since what they were doing was producing income for God, for that God's priests. Now, because in most Middle Eastern cultures, since time immemorial, prostitution indeed is seen as the world's oldest profession, it was accepted as completely legitimate, although not universally accepted. The temple saw it as an excellent opportunity to control a market that was quite lucrative. Basically, the idea was that the pagan temple would attach a religious aura to a man who spent his money in a brothel that was operated by the temple rather than a private one down the street. A customer and the prostitute were both made to feel as though they were doing something wonderful. With this overall understanding, now you can see why God forbade such things for Israel, even to go so far as to say that the money that had been gained from any kind of prostitution activity under any circumstances was never to be used for holy purposes like tithing or paying a vow price to the, to the temple of Jehovah or buying an animal sacrifice. I want to close today with this thought. The problem is that there can be no more illicit mixture than taking gain that is ill-gotten in the Lord's eyes and then turning around and offering it to Him as a holy thing. Further, this points out the problem of His people, whether Jew or Christian, thinking that we can somehow mix the things of the world with the things of the Lord and then wind up with something that is still good and righteous. Yeshua said to give unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Given to God the things that are God's. That is a simple New Testament way of putting forth this idea of not trying to bring things that belong in the sphere of the world into union with anything that belongs within the sphere of God's kingdom. That's the point. Well, the next time we meet, we will finish up this great chapter of Deuteronomy. Please rise. <laughs>